do consider that the alchemists fundamentally are historically our most ancient free thinkers. It is evident if you read actual alchemical literature, they plead uh, for people not to read anything dogmatically, that it must be read with the heart. They use language in a very interesting way, and they are not interested in dogma. Alchemists have a way of couching language in so many different ways because traditionally, if they were to be identified, they would be burnt at the stake by the church. That was the penalty, historically. However, the world got freer in Erlinger's time, and I think, and this is part of my thesis, is that this group of alchemists and esotericists combined really changed the nature of alchemical pursuit. They took it out of the laboratory and into philosophy. They took it into spirituality. And part of Erlinger's work, I think, was to free alchemy from its kind of dogmatic you know, the way it's defined, you know, turn lead into gold and all that stuff. Yo, this is O-Culture. I am Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. You actually caught it at a good time. New music, new logo, new format, and a fantastic guest named Richard Arman. Richard and I are going to be chatting about one of the most mysterious stories of early 20th century occultism, the life and death of French cultural and intellectual giant Irene Hallel Erlinger and her alchemical masterpiece, Voyage and Kaleidoscope. But first, you're listening to the song Frequencies by VHS Dreams. My thanks to him for the track. Link is in the show notes to the song on SoundCloud if you're interested. Also in the show notes, a link to psychedelic multimedia artist Wanderweird, who has supplied this show with a new logo. Check it out. It's a functioning sigil a lot of magical intent wrapped up in it. That's also, by the way, my first foray into the world of magic. And working on that logo with Wanderweird was pretty awesome. He's a good dude. We're actually trying to find a time to record an episode for this show. He's got a great interest in the occult and various mystery schools, and his work just vibes well with what I'm trying to do here. Which is also why Richard Arman is on the show. His work just vibes with me. And let me tell you why and also how Richard and I came into contact. And also expound a little bit on what we're going to be discussing. Because I do think it merits a little bit of exposition. Now, my introduction to the world of the occult and the esoteric came through music. One of my favorite bands is Tool. Probably my favorite band. I grew up listening to them, but it wasn't until a few years ago that I realized a lot of the symbols they use in their artwork and stage show and a lot of the themes in their lyrics are plucked straight from occult and esoteric teachings. So one day a few years ago, I'm on their website browsing through some past updates because (laughs) their webmaster, this guy named Blair McKenzie Blake, is also very much into the occult and honestly is a great writer, so the updates and the turns of phrase are actually quite entertaining and enlightening and informative. And check out toolband.com, you'll see what I mean. So I stumble upon a reference in one of the updates to this story about an author who was murdered in Paris, and the author is this relatively unknown French woman named Irene Hillel Erlinger, and the reason she was murdered because a book she published called Voyage and Kaleidoscope apparently divulged some arcane alchemical secret, and she just had to be dealt with. Now, I'm a sucker for stories like this, for mysteries like this, and I think most people probably are. I mean, think about it. You have this author in Paris in 1920 who's published this book that supposedly divulges some sort of ancient alchemical secret, and then she's murdered for it, and come on, man. That's a cool story. 
So I headed to the old search engine, and my life hasn't been the same since. I got immersed in this story and was researching it as much as I could. I had a copious and, and maybe unhealthy amount of notes on it, because it wasn't just about Erlinger and her book. It was about alchemy in general, and the Falconelli mystery is wrapped up in this, which is a subject for a whole other episode, and it just turned into this giant occult alchemical clusterfuck, and I just have spider webs of names and places and connections, and before I know it, I'm actually writing a novel based on the events too. But at some point, I realized that, you know, my research into alchemy and the general occult scene in Paris at this time was bearing a lot of fruit, but my research into Erlinger and her book was not. I'd hit a dead end with that. And then, also, every account of her on the internet told the same story, that she was murdered in Paris because of what was in her book. And I had overlooked something previously. I had overlooked the fact that I was getting the same story everywhere, no matter where I looked. And I don't know why that didn't raise a red flag previously, but at, at this point it did. So I told myself, I gotta dig deeper, I gotta find out more on this, but I didn't know where to go. I had exhausted all of the sources I could find on the internet. I thought about maybe going to the dark web, but that didn't seem like a good idea, really. But somehow, I stumble onto Goodreads, which is this user-driven social database of books and reviews. It's definitely a worthwhile place to check out if you're into books, by the way, and I don't know why I didn't hop on there before, but I went on there, and I wanted to see if, if Erlinger's book had been listed on it, and, you know, I should back up just a second. Erlinger's book, This Voyage in Kaleidoscope, was published in French in 1919, and after her death in 1920, her book was confiscated from Parisian bookshops, which adds another layer of intrigue to this story, right? So... Whatever original copies were sold in French are still out there, but there hadn't been any other version of the book published. Or I, I guess I should say there was no English version ever published, so I had no way to read this. But anyways, so I'm on Goodreads, and thankfully I found the book listed on there, and it had one review by a user named Richard, who just so happened to mention in his review of the book that he was taking it upon himself to translate it into English fucking jackpot, am I right? And thankfully, Goodreads has a, a feature where you can respond to people's reviews, and I had seen a couple other users respond to his review, so I jumped in there and started conversing with him on Goodreads. You can see the beginnings of our conversation on there, actually. My first comment was on July 2nd, 2015, and we exchanged a few other public comments on there until January 2016. Now, in January 2016, I probably spent the better part of two years researching this off and on. Meanwhile, I'm still trying to write this novel based on the events. And then fast forward to last summer, I believe it was like early August, I just got stuck on the writing because I just really wanted to read this damn book before I went any further. And by some twist of fate, I wind up on Amazon around this time too, and this, this book pops up. And like the recommended, you know, based on your browsing history or whatever, turns out a publisher in the Netherlands, I think, had published an English translation as an ebook back in September 2015. How the fuck did I miss that? Needless to say, I bought it, I read it, it really fucked my mind, and then I started private correspondence about it on Goodreads with Richard, and then that moved to email, and we exchanged emails for a couple of months, and then, well, that led to this conversation that you're about to hear, about three years in the making. And you know, Richard's own personal research into this matter is deeper and more impressive than mine would have ever been, mostly because he's traveled to Paris several times, and learned the language, which obviously gave him an advantage when it came to reading and researching other texts and accounts of the time in French. I mean, he's also working on a book about Erlinger and her work, and I dare say his knowledge of this subject is second to none, especially right now, here in 2017, when this woman, Irene Hillel Erlinger, is not only virtually unknown in the Western world, even in occult and esoteric circles, but She's also relatively unknown in her native France as well. So without further exposition, let's take a voyage through the kaleidoscope with Richard Arman.
Richard, hey, thanks for being here. I really appreciate your time. Okay. I'm happy to be here. And I'm, I'm glad that you're here. And um, we're talking tonight about... And you're going to have to help me out with some of the names here in terms of how to pronounce them. But yes. the the main reason for our conversation is we're talking about the life and the work of Irene. And is it Hillel Erlanger? Is that how you say her last name? Yes. Irene. It's sort of French. Yeah, Irene Hillel dash Erlanger. Okay, so it's pronounced Erlanger. All right. Okay. See, I already mispronounced it, so I was. It's hard. I've never heard anybody talk about her before, so I've I've only read the name. Yeah. So you know how that is. Yeah. Well, uh, she is she is hardly known in the English speaking world, and not that well known in the French speaking world either. But uh, but to a select group of uh, esotericists, I call them, and some occultists, and now you know that crowd, and also some uh, people that are interested in the history of cinema also know of her yeah so she's very important in those worlds well before we get into to that because i mean her her work is very interesting and then you know one specific book that she's written i'd like to talk about as much as we can too but we'll get to that in a minute let's talk about first of all who this woman is where she came from could you maybe just talk about her life her upbringing first of all here Uh, she was born in 1878 in paris to one of the wealthiest families in all of France. And they were a banking family called Commando. And the Commandos came to Paris in 1860 from Istanbul. And they were uh, they were a, a Sephardic Jewish family that had uh, started out in Portugal and uh, in the 14th century and ended up in Istanbul via Italy in Venice, and they were very important bankers. And uh, they were the, they were the bankers to the uh, you know Sultan you know of the Islamic Empire of the time. However, in Istanbul, they uh, wanted to educate women and poor people, and that got them kicked out of Istanbul. And so they chose to come come to Paris because in the uh, Uh, In Paris, it it was the most liberal society on the planet at that time. And it was intellectually wide open. And they joined uh, many other Jewish banking families uh, in Paris and became, you know, part of that large family of bankers. And she was born, as I said, 1878. And nothing is known about her until she married a popular composer by the name of Camille Erlinger who came from humble origins. Now, generally Jewish women were taught only to have babies and stay in the house, but they were also uh, they were also taught finances. And the women would take care of the family finances, and the men would take care of other people's finances. So it, uh, it, so it was a, a very interesting uh, way of, uh, of social organization. However, in Erlinger's, in Iran's case, she appeared not to be a typical woman. And uh, after she got married, uh, she married into the, the, the com- those wealthy families tended to have the banking side and a very liberal kind of entertainment side, you know, liberal education. And she fell on that side. And so she, rather than marry a banker, they married her off to this, this popular musician. They had a son who in fact started the Cannes Film Festival. His name was uh, Philippe Erlinger, a very well-known French uh, cultural figure. And um, they divorced in 1912. Uh, Divorce was practically unheard of coming in 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 favor of the woman, but because of her uh, financial prowess, she won. Uh, As it happened, scandal broke out. As, as it would if a woman won a divorce. It was a very scandalous thing. And uh, she brought scandal to her family, which was no, no light matter uh, for such a wealthy family. And in fact, she, according to her son, took her husband as a, lo- as a lover for the next eight years. You mean her, uh, her ex-husband then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, so they got divorced, uh, but they were still sleeping together for a while? Yeah. Yeah, okay. most likely at her insistence. It would have been her choice. But 
this, I'm, 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 say, I'm doing this to illustrate how that she was not, um, she was not a submissive type of person. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I, I, I say that because uh, here was a woman who, uh, who was not submissive and not to be submissive in 1912 uh, was to be condemned. She, however, had the power and the wealth uh, to go her own way. Uh, she wrote poetry, uh, much of which has been interpreted as being alchemical poetry, and the alchemists read it as alchemical poetry. The uh, University of Michigan has published all her poems recently. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of one of those print-on-demand print things. Okay. I got a hold of it right away, and it's really, uh, really, but it's all in French. It's not English. Oh, oh yeah, that's right, because, you know, she was French, obviously, so, okay. Yeah. I've had to, I have to spend eight years learning French to the extent that I know it now. <laughs> okay, so, so let's, let, to, yeah. let's talk about that just real quick then. Did you, yeah. or yes, how did you, first of all, stumble upon the work of, and are you saying her name Irene or Iran, or I, I, I couldn't pick up how you were actually well, saying that? Uh, in French, it's Irene. Okay. So me so being... I, I, I will pronounce it Irene. Okay, so I'm going to probably just keep saying Irene because I don't know any better. But... That's fine. That's fine with me. I have no objection. All right. So to your listeners, yeah. So how did you first stumble upon her work then? <laughs> That's a story in itself. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm a retired cello player and, uh, and also somewhat of an inventor. And I had invented a way of making an electric instrument that sounded like a great old instrument. And I got a, a kind of a, uh, a lot of attention, and I ended up in Paris showing off my wares in, a, in an exposition uh, right in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. But um, on a day off, I decided to uh, you know see the sights. I ended up at the Notre Dame Cathedral, and I've long had an interest in alchemy, probably since I was, you know, uh, late teens, and uh, and because and I wanted to see these images. I don't know if you know of them, but they're at eye level, right in front of the Notre Dame Cathedral. And this, to people like Fulcanelli, is the textbook of alchemy. Right, in, right there, there are twenty images. Mm-hmm. And that's just and, to uh, take a tangent real quick. Is that's the basis for his book about the mystery of the cathedrals, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. And so I had a look at that, and I was really surprised because they look they do not look religious at all. They, they look very secular. And as Fulcanelli describes them, he says, he says they're, they're, they're like a riot going on, you know. So I went uh, to a, a nearby bookstore, quite a famous one that uh, called Shakespeare's, and I asked about if there was a book on that subject. And he said, uh, the sales guy said, you have to go over a, a block uh, west, and there's a little street called Huchette, and there's a bookstore there called the Emerald Table. They'll have what you want. Well, so that, I took this walk and ended up in, yeah. I was going to say, that the so name of that bookstore walk. is very hermetic. Yes, it is a hermetic bookstore. It, it was. It's no longer there. And I walked in, and it was it was it was just uh, jaw dropping. You know, if, if you like occult books, this this is, you know, this is the the, the treasure. <laughs> you you discovered the treasure room, you know. And uh, so I bought the mysteries of the cathedral. They had a copy in English, published in London. It was very expensive, but anyway, I bought that, and I bought uh, a couple of books by uh, Ken Sellier. Um, who is purported to be uh, uh, Fulcanelli's uh, protege. And uh, Cancelier, Cancelier was considered to be one of the most important people in 20th century alchemy. He died in 1986. So I, I, uh, I was really happy with him, and that's how I, that's how I discovered it. And in one of Cancelier's book on alchemy, there's, there's a strange picture of a woman... Uh, in civilian dress, and there's also a picture of a of, of a, an image. You may have seen it on the web uh, of a of a naked woman standing on the planet Earth. 
with her feet in some kind of strange brew. Yeah, is that Champagne's The Vessel of the Great Work? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I was uh, I you know I, I I was very curious about that. And uh, so I bought that book and another one called uh, De Logie, which is uh, you know another major alchemical book, and um, got home with it. But my career had to continue, and I really for another tw- another twenty years I, I really ignored this. However, in the nineties, uh, I was back in Paris on another kind of job, and uh, and the Emerald Table had published a facsimile edition of Erlinger's Voyage, and I picked that up real quick and, uh, and got it home, although I didn't pay attention to it until 2006, and uh, I was about to retire, and I decided to examine this book as closely as I could, and <laughs> I got a translator uh, to translate it for me at considerable expense, and, uh, and then I got to... Uh, uh, editing his translation over the next uh, number of years. It's, it's still not really quite finished. But um, that's the story of how I came about it. And I've had 10 years to really look at uh, at uh, Erlinger's work very closely. And so uh, I've, I've come, uh, come at a point where uh, I have interest from two universities to, uh, to publish uh, not only my translation, but uh, but as well a book about Erlinger. Right. Could you talk a little bit about... Oh, oh sorry. I, I was just going to say, could you talk a little bit more about what actually led you to her directly? I, I don't think we touched on that point, and I'd like to, because you just... Well, uh, you, know, this is, you know, the strange thing, Ryan, is, is that uh, in the book as a, that I was browsing in, the, in that bookstore in Paris... On the back of the plate that showed a portrait of a woman in civilian dress, mm-hmm. it said, this is a woman who, in effect, hung out at Irene Erlinger's salons. And, uh, and it was a, quite a devoted, wonderful statement, like a, like a devotional thing. And, uh, and the name Irene Hillel Erlinger, for some reason, and this is where I really am mystified, I made a decision then that I wanted to find out who this is. And I spent $300 on those books. Wow, yeah. And carted them out. They were very, you know, limited editions and hard to get stuff, you know. Now they're worth a couple of thousand dollars. Right. But, um, uh, so, it, you know, I, it was just an intuition of mine. And uh, I've always, since I was a kid, like 12 years old, I've loved a mystery. And I've always thought that there was there were there was a kind of life other than the mundane one that I was living as a kid. I was not a happy child, and I wish there was an alternative. And I think many people that get involved in you know esoteric studies have that in common. You know, we're seekers. So this discovery of uh, my discovery of Erlinger was kind of like a decision to to really do some serious seeking. I was gonna say, yeah, I, Does that help? yeah, absolutely, yeah. and I would agree with you. I, I think anybody who ventures down the path of esoteric or occult studies, it's to me, it's like you're you're just on a quest for meaning, you know, where something like religion doesn't do it, something like science doesn't do it. You just kind of need to, yeah, it's just a different avenue to find some sort of, I think, spiritual meaning, yeah, and things like alchemy definitely i think play yeah. a role in yeah. in that that quest yeah. obviously so yeah. um you outlined erlinger's um upbringing she came from a, a wealthy banking family so you've researched her life at what point did her connection to esotericism or occultism become clear well <laughs> a few years into her marriage uh as a young mother she discovered that her husband had not only one, but many mistresses. He was famous. He could have anything he wanted. He was, you know, the Donald Trump of music (laughs) in the day, you know, (laughs) so to speak, you know, he could have whatever he wanted. And in fact, her son describes in an autobiography that his most famous mistress 
who was really a well-known star, proposed to Erlinger that they both live domestically with her husband. And uh, Erlinger, of course, turned her down. And he, he could not stop uh, fooling around, so to speak. And uh, she applied for a divorce. As it happened uh, a few years before that she made the divorce, it, it was actually legal for, for the first time for a woman to divorce a man. Um, she did that and she was successful and she got custody of the child. Then she wrote poetry and she was very active, very busy in her circle. At the beginning, she was very much involved with the publishing uh, businesses of that era, the uh, literary journals. Andre Gide, I don't know if you're familiar with that name, mm -hmm. Yeah, a famous French writer. She was uh, kind of a, like a, a business manager of his, and she organized his affairs and um, uh, possibly also financially helped, helped him around. And uh, she also contributed financially to the establishment of quite a famous uh, journal called Liter Literature, which uh, which was a spelling of literature, which in which where the word looks like litter, as in cat litter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> literature with two T's. Now was that like a joke or something, or is that was that just that how they was, spelled that it? That was a joke. Okay. That was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, you know, it was meant to, to be an irreverent journal, and she financed it. Uh, so she was involved in that, and she wrote and published poetry in in. Uh, some of the really well-known uh, journals of the day. Uh, she was also socially very famous. She was, and, and I have images of newspapers of that day, she was mentioned in the society columns all the time. If there was a big show on, like an opera, the, the gossip columns would all you know, tell everybody exactly where she sat, who she sat with. When she went on vacation, they followed her on her vacation. She was a superstar. Because they, she was such a wealthy socialite. They had gossip columns so all the way back had, then, too? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, oh. in, a very, in a very serious way. Yeah. So she was, uh, you know, she was really well-known as a society woman. So when, and, and, and also because she had brought scandal to Paris with a divorce, and she had made a lot of enemies, especially of the male establishment. Her poetry was well-regarded and well-reviewed. And around 1915, oh yeah, let, let me go back a little bit. Uh, World War One broke out in 1914, and in 1915 she met a woman by the name of Germaine Dulac, who was a filmmaker and director, and she was to be the first feminist filmmaker in the world in silent film. The two of them went together, and and, uh, and and they actually formed a company to produce silent films. And the silent films were very feminist. And I've studied this, and the, the the film scholars that I know are really fascinated by what might have been Erlander's influence on the silent films that they produced. So I'm also involved in a in a study of Erlander for. Uh, a paper that the Columbia University puts out, and uh, and it's quite a fascinating project of itself. But uh, she also uh, was in a lesbian relationship with Dulac, and it appears that she was probably bisexual, although I don't want to insist on that. It seems apparent. The two of them were obviously an incredibly powerful intellectual match. I have to classify Erin Erlinger as a as an intellectual kind of giant. She was really smart and managed to outsmart people around her. And she was not shy about it. And she raised a lot of resentment amongst, um, you know, the, the male, the males around her in the literary world that wanted to dominate. So she was also not terribly popular with the establishment in, in, in the world of literature. Uh, in the, in the world of, um, the, uh, occult, her guru was, his name was Stanislas de Garita. I don't know if that name is familiar to you. Mm, not really. Could you talk about who that is then? Yeah. He uh, had a movement called the 
Kabbalistic Order of the Rosy Cross. And he got together with another occultist, Joseph Teladan, and they formed this very powerful society. It was an edu- uh, largely an educational society, and they developed a system of occult knowledge, not unlike Golden Dawn. All these groups mingled in Paris, although there's no evidence anywhere that she actually had a membership in any of these groups. It would seem obvious that she touched on them in a very profound manner, but she probably, as a very wealthy socialite, would not have wanted to be seen to be part of that world. Well, you did mention that she held salons, um, which I don't know if people know what salons yes. are back in that time. They're not they're not hair salons yeah. or nail salons. The culture of, of salons is, is, is French and started really in the 17th century. These were started largely by very wealthy women that had nothing better to do than to entertain intellectuals and artists. And that became a, a strong tradition, and it really contributed to the fact that Paris became kind of the world's capital of liberal thinking, where new ideas could be discussed, new forms of literature, and all that kind of stuff. And especially, Erlinger would have been at the forefront at uh, at the most adventurous end of it. And uh, her own son describes how her salons grew scandalous when she invited the Dadaists. You know what I'm referring to as Dadaists? Data art movement. Yeah. Now, part of my thesis is that she was very deeply involved in that movement. And she was deeply involved in its coming to Paris because she was in a very tight circle with the people that brought the founder of Data from Zurich, Switzerland, to Paris. And what happened was, I, I don't want to lose continuity. Uh, so I have a diagram I, I'm going to bring up here. Sure. Take your time. Uh, on, my, on my screen. So her salon, if we put her salon at the center of a diagram, and we look at the the various disciplines that were involved, there was one, the esoteric, with the alchemists. Most of those actually took place at the de Lesseps family home in Paris. The de Lesseps were an extremely powerful family of engineers, and uh, they were also patrons of Champagne. So you can see that connection. Champagne was in, was in there, was employed by them. And that's, that's uh, Jean Julien Champagne, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's so there's that circle as one part of her salon. There's another circle of literature, which would involve Louis Aragon and uh, the Dadists, people like Jean Cocteau and uh, Louis Aragon who I discuss a lot, because I think they had a very close relationship. Then we have the business of data. Data was the answer, the artistic answer to what had happened at the end of World War I was, you know, some 30 to 40 million people were slaughtered, you know, in that war. It was said that data was born of disgust. And they said, well, if, if all the European intellect and advanced society ends up with the slaughter of that many people, we won't have any part of it. And that's how the data business was born. And I place Erlinger in the middle of that movement. And it becomes plain in her book, Voyage, where she criticizes things going on around her quite severely. And she also does so in the cinema, in the films, and the salon had these various aspects of it, but she brought all these elements together. For her, I think the occult revival and the occult itself was not really separate from any other concern that she had, which is why she pulled it all together, ultimately in her book. Yeah, and before we get into Voyage, um, because I do want to spend some yeah. time talking about that book specifically, I do want to yeah. discuss just for a moment this connection in her salons, to the occultist, to the alchemist, I want to tell our listeners that we mentioned Fulcanelli a few minutes ago. We've mentioned uh, jean Julien yeah. Champagne a couple of times. Could we yeah. talk for a moment about the Fulcanelli mystery and kind of how it plays into this whole movement in general here? Well, I made a discovery 
almost two years ago. Well, two years ago, exactly, I was in Paris doing some research, and, and, and it was just really amazing. I found that Alkani is generally has no names. Fulcanelli is a mystery because it, there is only speculation as to who Fulcanelli actually was. There is no speculation as to who Champagne was. There is no speculation as to who Erlinger was. There is no speculation as to who Cancellier was. But it would seem to me, this is only a guess, but it's a, it's a reasonable conclusion, is that collectively they took on the name Fulcanelli and invented that name for the work that they did. And so you tie the Fulcanelli name to a group then that includes people yes, like Champagne. Exactly. So is Erlinger part of that group as well? Yes. Okay. Very much so. Yeah. And according to uh, Champagne, she was very, very deeply involved in that group. We did mention this is the De La Seps group. Did I say that name right? Yeah, De La Seps. Yeah. Okay. De La Seps. De La Seps. a family yeah. of engineers, actually. Extremely wealthy. You know, they, they, they actually built the Suez Canal. Right. They do have this interest in alchemy because they are showing up at these salons. Yes. They're actually hosting some of them, too. We might touch on that when we get into some yes. further conversation here. But, you know, to, to, to encompass that conversation, we would say that, that the Deleuze did not exclude any of these ideas. So the lack of dogma in the alchemy crowd allowed it to be very free-thinking. And I do, I do consider that the alchemists fundamentally are historically our most ancient free thinkers. Why do you say that? I say that because it is evident in their, in, in if you read their, if you read actual alchemical literature, they plead uh, for people not to read anything dogmatically, that it must be read with the heart, so to speak. They use language in a very interesting way. And they are not interested in dogma. They have a way, alchemists have a way of couching language in so many different ways because traditionally, if they were to be identified, they would be burnt at the stake by the church. That was the penalty, historically. However, the world got freer in Erlinger's time. And I think, and this is part of my thesis, is that this group of alchemists and esotericists combined really changed the nature of alchemical pursuit. They took it out of the laboratory and into philosophy. They took it into spirituality. And part of Erlinger's work, I think, was to free alchemy from its kind of dogmatic, you know, the way it's defined, you know, turn lead into gold and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that project of that group was, it was incredibly uh, fertile and, and, and extremely productive in terms of ideas and even devices. I mean, Champagne invented the propeller. Right. He invented the propeller that he was working for the Delethus. And when they, you know, when they made the first propeller, when this thing goes around, it propels things forward, you know? And that came from an alchemist. Alchemy branched out, you know? Yeah. Like, every time I read about alchemy and people that are most famously associated with it, it does seem like it's these really kind of wealthy, high society types. Why does this group in particular take an interest in something like alchemy, you think? I think because it, it, it encompasses so much. In alchemy is also, if you read Fulcanelli, especially the English version of Mysteria de Cathedral, mm -hmm. and, um, you find right away that the central thesis of Fulcanelli is that alchemy is more about language than anything else. And, and that, that language is so free and so flexible, especially in French. The French language, for every word we have that might have two or three meanings, the French generally have 20 meanings for a given word, depending on the context. So there are sentences in, in Erlinger's book that can be taking, taken in a dozen different ways. And if you find one, you may really discover something truly interesting that is very revealing when she talks about language in that little alphabet voyage, you know. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, I'm very happy that these people uh, did this uh, translation that you've read. Yeah, 
it's I was, good that it's out there. I was glad to see that too. Um, we, we haven't even mentioned it, that yeah. there is um, an English translation available right now in an ebook form on Amazon. I, I think yeah. you get it right. So I, yeah. I did read yeah. through that. And it's I, definitely a, a worthy read. Uh, however, I, I find it falls short in, in some senses, but it's, it's, it's healthy and good that it's out there. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned alchemy in language, and I, I think it's important to point out, too, that alchemy is also a language of symbols, right? Yes. For me, the Erlinger's Riot Act is in the, um, in the frontispiece. Thankfully, they put out the frontispiece in the, in the translation that we were just talking about. And that is kind of a riot act, where she says, this is not a novel, even less so a character study. We simply tried with fervor to grasp and define a few signs. Now, that wouldn't be my trans. My translation is, we have simply tried with fervor to grasp and fix a few signs. And the fix a few signs is to say, we are going to establish some language issues in this book. So then you you look at the cover of the book, and really the rest of the front of space describes the cover. And the cover is really the most important part of the book. Mm-hmm. We think of the cover just as a cover. But the cover is actually a visual instruction manual. It's not just a diagram. It is actually like an operating manual. Yeah, and the cover of the book, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. It does have these alchemical symbols on it. Yes. It has the symbols of the four classical elements. Yeah. Um, I can't really tell. Yeah. I'm not really familiar with what the symbols in the middle are here in terms of the circles that are connected. Well, this is my reading of it. The three triangles pointing upwards are triple fire. Now, triple fire to an alchemist is called our fire. Now, what that says is it's a spiritual fire. The triple indicates spiritual. And, uh, and the triangles pointing down is a spiritual water. And, uh, and it is spiritual because it's something that we're not aware of physically. So we have those two elements in a circle in between the two, which would seem to be have to go either way, up or down. So I relate that circle to the protagonist who is confused which way to go, mm-hmm. whether it's going up or down. In the book, she says you have to have a, a child's point of view, which is the circle below, the Gilly figure, Gilly. And, uh, and, and Gilly makes the projections with a, with a clean palette, so to speak. As a mechanism, it really has a mecha- make, makes sense mechanically because you have what looks like fast forward and fast backward. You know those symbols that we have on tape machines? Yeah. Like, you know, fast forward yeah. and uh, rewind, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And in the Voyage book, there is there is so much discussion about things moving along just beautifully, and then and then things moving backwards, and all kinds of hell breaks loose when it moves backwards. Right. So we have in that in that cover diagram a, a real uh, a really I don't even want to call it well, it's an image. But it's a working image. It's not just something artistic which just sits on the canvas and does nothing else. This is actually a working thing. Erlinger designed this cover to exact specifications, and she had her friend, an artist, Van Dongen, do it exactly to her specifications. Because in all likelihood, any other artist would say, wait a minute, you want me to do it? I'm an artist. I'll figure out what to do. But she had exact specifications. In the French commentaries on her work, there's a lot of discussion of that cover and then all the hidden meanings. Uh, one French commentator says that if, if you look closely at the cover of the book, the word endoscope is there, which means that it's looking inside of us. It's a view of ourselves. And, uh, and, and that's a very profound concept, that this kaleidoscope is... is uh, is truly something that looks both outside and inside simultaneously. And I think the idea there is for that we lead a life that is open to the extent that, that, that we don't limit the outside world to the outside and, and our inside world to our inside. Mm-hmm. So I think it kind of erases that, you know, that body-mind dualism 
that's plagued society for many, so many centuries, you know? Yeah. Now you mentioned um, the protagonist earlier talking about the circle yeah. on the cover of this, this book. Could you maybe uh, run through a brief synopsis of just what the actual storyline in the book is? Well, the storyline is, is, uh, begins with a catastrophe, you know, mm -hmm. the kaleidoscope, just, it fucks up. Yeah. And, uh, it, it doesn't do the work it was supposed to do. And, uh, throughout the book, you know, we, we, we find out why. However, in the meantime, uh, the protagonist goes crazy because he has failed in this big show that he was supposed to do. To bring to bring his kaleidoscope out to the public, and it all screws up, and he runs away. He goes crazy. He starts wandering the streets like a crazy guy, and uh, he runs into Grace, and Grace, uh, to put it bluntly, <laughs> gets him into rehab. And you don't have to say that even lightly because it is rehab yeah. that they're they're talking about the restor the restoration of his mental health. Because he is crazy and he's screaming in the streets. The scream wasn't empty. It wasn't empty. It wasn't, you know. We should probably tell listeners what the protagonist's name is, uh, Joel. Jose he... Joel. Yeah. Now, Jose, the word in French means I dare. I, okay. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. That's, he's, he's the one who dares. Yeah, he's, he's the alpha male. So or hopes to be. he's an inventor and he invents this, this contraption called a kaleidoscope. What does it actually do then? Well, it, it both records and projects the contents of the subject's mind through the eye, through the iris. And it stores the, all the information about that person into what, what is described really as what I call a hard drive. Mm -hmm. And it does really say it's a drive made of galenium pellets. Galenium is, it was was used in you know in in hard drives twenty years ago. It was all that was used, so it's a bit ahead of its time too. Or gallium, I think it's called. And through this process, people will find out who they really are instead of being just slaves to the world. It's a liberating. It was supposed to be a li completely liberating experience. And that was what he proposed, and he worked so hard to get. And uh, an interesting point about the occult. Because she does mention that he, he, he retired from the studies of the occult, which he found disappointing, and, uh, and, and, and got into like inventing some real actual device, similar to our previous discussion of, of champagne, inventing the propeller. These people were also practical. They had to make a living. They did real interesting stuff. And so this, is, so, uh, this attempt to actually build a device, now to us, if we back off a little bit from that description, we really see that he's he's inventing the movie theater. Mm -hmm. he, he's really inventing cinema, uh, and anything we put into cinema can reveal our states of mind. Can you know? It's an endlessly creative process. So it comes into a, a whole discussion of the business of uh, moving pictures, which were new at the time. That was a, a new business. That was not known before, the, the, the degree to which it, it, it evolved at that time in 1919. And Charlie Chaplin owned the world. You know, he was so popular. And he just had everybody, their lives would change. They would go into the theater and they would come out happy. There was no previous experience where someone went into a theater, you know, paid five cents or whatever, and came out happy. It was transforming. So the, so the idea that images are, can be transforming comes into play here. And so that's, that's both practical and extremely esoteric. I want to get a little more into the book now. You mentioned the frontispiece. I, I actually want to go back to the dedication, if we could. I should mention, I, I do have some points I want to make in a chronological fashion. Yeah. So my apologies yeah. for going back on this. But I want to talk about the dedication when you get beyond the actual story of the book and you get to the symbolism and then you get to the story yeah. of the book itself in a cultural, you know, sense and, and its impact and yeah. then who's actually tied to the book. It's all these things become yeah. very interesting, very intriguing. So and I think it starts yeah. with the with the dedication and I'm going to pull it up real quick and I'm just going to 
just going to read it word for word if I can. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so Erlinger dedicates this book to the great soul of L.B. Now, when you start to, to research this book, if you even do just some basic, you know, Google searching about it, you turn up yeah. that this L.B. that the book is dedicated to is Louise, is it Barbie? Is that how you say her last name? Uh, Barb. Barb? Yeah. Just Barb? Okay. So yeah, you, you, yeah, it would be in French. It would just call Barb. Okay, Louise so... Barb. So you turn up that the LB stands for Louise Barb, or more specifically, uh, Marguerite Louise Barb, uh, who was supposedly a practicing alchemist in Paris at this time. And Barb was born, I'm just going to go through a quick biography of her from what I've just researched very surface level, born in 1879, died in 1919, we'll get to that a little later. Um, She's the ex-wife of Dr. Serge Voronoff, is that how you say his name? Yes. Uh, and yeah. Serge was the director of the laboratories of the College of France. So there's an interesting chemical, alchemical yeah, connection. Yeah, um, he was a monkey gland doctor. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. I was, I was just yeah. going to say that. He's most famous for yeah. his research into that. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. But he and uh, Marguerite divorced in 1916. Uh, not that that's important, but they weren't married for very long. Now, Barb also was speculated to be the illegitimate daughter of Ferdinand de Lesseps, who we mentioned a while ago, who was the the patriarch of this great engineering family and who supervised the construction of the Suez Canal. And he had two sons, Pierre and Bertrand, who hosted salons for the Parisian elite, uh, most of which were practicing occultists, which I think we've kind of established that. And Marguerite Louise Barb was part of this community which included, as we established, artists and alchemists, and also members of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. There's even an interesting connection that Barb may have served as the last... I don't even know how you say this word. Is it premonstratix? Yeah. That she served as the last... Yeah, I've read that. Yeah, yeah, that that she served as as the last premonstratix of the Golden Dawn's uh, Paris temple, and apparently contributed some documents about alchemy to the temple. Let's consider all of this. Despite all these connections on the surface between Marguerite Louise Barb to Erlinger and her social circle, you say that LB in the dedication is not Louise Barb, but instead is someone else. So who is it then? Yes. Who else it is is offered by Cancelier. And Cancelier's daughter, Isabel, was, was his closest associate. And she says that L.B. stands for Leon Bloy, B-L-O-Y. If you Google Bloy, you find uh, a social critic, unsparing, devoted to poverty, and radical poverty. Uh, he was a merciless critic of the church and, and the church as a wealth, you know, as a wealthy institution and useless to the, to the poor. I've gotten this from... Uh, I, I took a trip around, I, I, I used to work around France on my business, and I was in this little bookstore in uh, in Lyon, and, um, and I found this alchem- stack of old alchemical magazines. And in it was an, all, an article written by Cancelier's daughter about Erlinger. And she says, Leon Bloy, it was Leon Bloy to whom her book was dedicated and she explains exactly why. I've looked into that, and when one gets really familiar with the with the voyage, we find ultimately that Erlinger is really a socialist, an early socialist. Mm-hmm. And that I think that got her into more trouble than anything she did in her life. Leon Bloy was was a soldier for the poor, and and I think Erlinger's personality type was as uncompromising as was his except she was in the extreme wealthy end of the spectrum and he was at the other end but he was a famous author and it happened that they had shared the same publisher and they probably knew each other now the question of louise barb is interesting you know the last time i was in paris i really tried to track down some hard information about her and there's none except that she probably knew the Commando family. 
because the de Lesseps family built the Suez Canal and Erlinger's family financed it. So those two families were intimately involved. And Erlinger probably knew Louise Barb, but there is no evidence of Louise Barb actually, there's no known photograph of her. Some people propose that the picture I told you about the woman in civilian dress mm -hmm. it might, is, is Louise Barb. That's what the Louise Barb people think, because it says she hung out at Erlinger's salon. But I wouldn't trust the, the alchemists, including Cancelier, to be accurate, because they coached everything. They did not want to identify anyone in a particular location at a particular time. They would not do that, because they could not betray each other's identities. That was a hard and fast rule. Only Erlinger took the risk, although she never declares herself an alchemist. I, I went to the, uh, there's a huge library in Paris, and I found uh, uh, information about the opening of the Suez Canal. Uh, and, her, and Louise Barber's name is mentioned as being the wife of Voronoff, who at the time, the clinic in Egypt, and they were invited to the opening of the Suez Canal. And whether er Erlinger and, and, and Louise Barb knew each other, I, I, I can't, I could never answer that question. The picture of Erlinger uh, that is best known as one that was taken probably in 1918 or so, if you put that picture next to the picture that some people say is Louise Barb, I took the picture, I took both pictures to the police department here in Toronto, and I asked the the um, they, they have ID people there. Mm -hmm. I said, "Are these the same person?" And they said, "Yeah, it's the same person. It's the same face. All the measurements are exactly the same." So the picture is of Erlinger and not Louise Barb. In fact, the uh, in in Cancelier's book it suggests that Erlinger actually posed for that picture. The one that you say is the picture of the woman in civilian dress is actually not Barb, like a lot of people think, that it's actually Erlinger. Yeah, it is actually. Yes, well, according to the police here in Toronto, right. they say it's the same face. They have software that, that turns the angle of the face straight to the front, and with that they can measure you know, the, the distance between the eyes and all that. Okay. He says I'm the same person. So <laughs> that was a point of research that I wanted to make because I didn't want to publish documents that might be spurious. You know, my introduction to this book was in the realm of there's this great, you know, kind of occult conspiracy behind it that we're gonna I want to talk about the death of Erlinger here in a second. It's, it makes it out to be this very fanciful narrative that's constructed around around Erlinger, around Barb, um, and it makes it out to be this alchemical mystery of sorts, which I think is probably what they want, yeah. you know, on some level. They're probably okay with that. Yeah. So you've now kind of deconstructed the myth that the LB and the dedication to this book is Louise Barb. Just through your research, it's shown that it's that's probably not the case. It's probably what it's, it's, um, I, I think it's Leon Bloy. As a matter of fact, the last time I was in Paris, I bought a book of his, published in 1923, in one of those on I mean, one of those book stalls right on the river. I couldn't believe I got it. And they only charged me 25 euros for it. Wow, it's worth a lot more than that. Also, yeah. in the book, there's a drawing of a thermometer. When you okay, so I don't know if we should, if we talk about that first, or we talk about Erlinger's death and how it's all connected. I don't know how to handle this material, to be honest, to make sense of it. But okay. so Erlinger dies in 1920, and yeah. the story that you find on the internet, like I said, with just some very basic searching on the internet, is very conspiratorial sounding. And I'm just gonna re yes. I'm just gonna recount the story. I don't have it written down. I'm just gonna recount it off the top of my head. So okay. cor so correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. Yeah. The story is yeah. is that Erlinger is at a book launch party. That's kind of I think what it, what you would call it now. But she's at she's at a party for the release of yeah. her book, which has already been out for a while, a few months probably. And she yeah. she apparently eats some oysters and falls ill and dies within the next few days. 
Supposedly, yeah. there were other people that ate the same oysters that didn't become ill, so immediately the story is, well, she must have been poisoned. And then you go to the fact that after she dies, all of the copies of Voyage are confiscated from the Parisian bookshops. So that's curious, and it would lead maybe someone to believe that the two events were connected. Her death, the confiscation of the book. Well, what's the book about? Why did the book get confiscated? Why did this person maybe get poisoned? And then so you go to the book, yeah. and I think that's where the thermometer comes in. And yeah. the story from the, from the occult conspiracists is that the thermometer itself divulges some great alchemical secret of the temperatures, you know, of turning lead into gold. Like I said, that's a very fanciful narrative that someone constructed at some point yeah, in yeah. history. What do we know yeah. about that and how true that may or may not be? Okay, I'm going to let that be uh, because it's very foreign to me in terms of, of the kind of work that I do. I follow things as closely as possible without theory. So I don't have a theory as to why she died. But if I follow the events... There's an interesting thread, and this is a little bit detective-like. So I'm going to just uh, have a go at it right now. She published the book in October 1919. Shortly after she published that, she published a little story called Paramour, which seems to be kind of an addendum to Voyage. Gee, you know, I should send you my translation of that little little book. It's eight pages long. Okay. Uh, it's a beautiful little piece. And it's, uh, I've, I've translated it, so it's got a lot of panache. It's really, and I'm, I'm rather proud of it, and so are my, my professor friends. In, especially in the octopus chapter in the voyage, she actually betrays her own social class, loud and proud. Mm -hmm. If you were to revisit that chapter in the octopus, you would see exactly what I mean. Well, if she I could... She goes after her own family. If I could just pause you for just a moment, I actually have a note here about it. In this chapter that's called The Octopus, she essentially, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm misinterpreting this, but she essentially compares capitalism to an octopus and says that the taxpayers keep the octopus alive by kind of wandering through its tentacled corridors of material needs. Yeah. And that money itself yeah. is made to be consumed and that nothing will ever change and that and now I'm going to quote her. She says this. She writes, When one despotic capitalist gives way, another tyrant steps forward. So yes. coming from a wealthy banking family to essentially denounce capitalism, denounce the system that your family has made its fortune in, definitely exactly what you said. She's calling out her own social yeah. class. Ryan, you've nailed it. So based Congratulations. On, oh, thank you. Yeah. So, so based on that... Based on that, just that one brief passage from that chapter, you could draw yeah. the conclusion that, well, her family, not very proud that this book was published with that in it, and yeah. I'm not yeah, saying let me, that... Let me, let me just go on a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Let me go on a little bit about to, to firm this up. At the time that she wrote this book, her uncle Salomon, Halfon, uh, who was the scion of the, of, the, of the whole extended family at that time, was president of, of an international bank. And uh, he, he and, the, and the whole group of, of families, they were all intermarried, owned this bank. And it's, the bank still exists. It's one of the most powerful banks. The business of the bank is actually to protect the money of diplomats and diplomatic missions. That's what it does. So... It would be apparent that only the commando family, represented by her uncle, would have the power to actually pay for all the books to come off the shelves of retail stores and to actually convince the publisher to cease publication and pulp the plates. They would have had to pulp the plates. You know, in the printing press of those days, yeah. it was all lead. They mm -hmm. would have had to destroy the plates because those original plates were never found. And that publishing company was a very powerful publishing company. And they also published Leon Boyd's poetry and his prose. But they could not refuse 
the uh, commando family of the bankers. They could not refuse the bankers. Now, it is apparent, and this I believe to be true, Erlinger uh, was in remission for quite a few months from uh, tuberculosis. She was seeing a, a throat doctor for, for, for a long time, and the remission ended, and, 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 and it actually some few days it was discovered that she would not survive. And so it was a very sudden thing. And in documents that a friend of mine has from Duloc's archives in Paris, Duloc describes, you know, the sadness of, of Erlinger's mother, who has to see her daughter die of this frightening disease. In fact, her, her friend Duloc uh, made a movie shortly after, and, and, and it toured all over the United States and the world, and it was uh, a, a, a movie to, uh, to raise funds to find a cure for tuberculosis. The movie was called The Disappearance of the Sun. Okay. So uh, it, it appears that she died of tuberculosis. And upon her death, because they would not want to make her aware of what they planned they had with her book, upon her death, they executed this plan to destroy her books and the plates so that she would have a fitting funeral because they would not be able to give her a proper funeral if she was known as a socialist. So where did the idea that she was poisoned by oysters come from? Do you have any inclination where that you know, idea... I really don't know. I really don't know where that came from. I, I just... Tuberculosis was called the writer's disease at that time, you know? Mm-hmm. The number of people that she knew also died of tuberculosis. I, you know, I really can't imagine where they, where that story came from. I've not been able to find any source for that story, as popular as it seems to be. And because I'm, I'm trying to be a good researcher, if I can't find a source, I can't, I can't let it in. Right. I can't let it in on the on, on, on the idea that this is some people have this idea, but uh, but I know that uh, French you know Jacques Simonelli wrote a beautiful kind of French book about Erlinger's in along with a, a later publication of Voyage, and, and he says he says you know very very definitely she died of tuberculosis, and uh, and the letter from her mother pretty well described that. And I think it's important, too, that we point out that Louise Barb died within a few months of Erlinger as well, right? That I, that I don't know. I've also heard that she died in 1910 in an explosion in her laboratory. Yeah, there's, there's different accounts of her death, that she died in some sort of alchemical experiment yeah. from drinking yeah. potable gold, I think, and then... But yeah. but that was much earlier, and then and then there's reports that she died within a few months of Erlinger as well, and I think yeah. the occult conspiracy theorists kind of hone in on that that later date because it it ties together everything nicely for them that that Erlinger yeah. dies, Barb dies, yeah. the books confiscated, they're both occultists, they both have an interest in alchemy, and all of a sudden, like, there's this, yeah. there's this very fanciful uh, story out there about their yeah. deaths and being linked. Yeah. yeah. But, like you said, some simple research kind of puts all that to rest. Well, it appears that her death was from tuberculosis, and, and the disappearance of her papers, not only that book, yeah. but her papers... Her personal papers did not survive, and it appears they were all pulp too, because we don't have a ream of letters from her in some archives. The pulping of the book was a family affair to save the family's reputation. They did not want to have a socialist in the family, because they were amongst the wealthiest family in all of France. Well, they were about a hundred years too quick on that, because it seems that all wealthy families now are socialists. That's a little... uh. Maybe maybe too too political there, but among amongst each other, yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. They um, take care of each other. <laughs> definitely. So you called her at the beginning of this conversation, or maybe you didn't say it while we were talking here 
on the air, but you've referred to her in some email correspondence as a genius. You did say she had a, yeah. she was a rather high intellectual type earlier. Why somebody that's so intelligent and so responsible for as many cultural, she's had a great cultural impact. Why is she still unknown to most of the world then? Uh, be- because because uh, her work was destroyed. And all the evidence we have is in this book that we're discussing. And the book, in, in my mind, is one of the most brilliant books I've ever read on any level. In her day, the big newspapers didn't like her book at all. They just said, oh, it doesn't make any sense. She doesn't even know how to write. She's, it's too, you know, it's too crazy. And, uh, and except, but all the, all the, all the social minded papers, um, all the left wing papers, uh, raved, raved, uh, gave her rave review for it. So I think, I think, uh, you know, there was a polarization there. So her family had to fix it, had to, had to do that. And she had a huge, all practically a state funeral as a commando member of the commando family. And even the, the highest dignitaries of the French government were at her funeral. And that was a reward that, that became possible because it was then unknown that she was a socialist. I think that her book was pulp for political reasons, and her death was from tuberculosis. The brilliance, the, her, her brilliance is, is in the, her ability to synthesize all these things into this little book. It's only 120 pages long. Mm-hmm. It's a small book, and it's so compact, and it says so much in so few words. I can't believe it. Psychologically, like, it's a masterpiece. You know, I haven't read anything like this before, and I've I've read a lot of books, not as many as you have, but I've I've read quite a few, and I I like it because of that psychological aspect. It does have a spiritual aspect as well, I think, and but yeah. just you know, like we talked about that chapter with the octopus that. The whole book that is kind of encapsulated in that chapter where it just seems to disparage ideas like elite social classes and money and yeah. also on yeah. some level like the material existence that we live here on Earth. She doesn't seem to be a fan yeah. of that. Yeah. But like I said, it does hint at a sort of spiritual existence beyond this this realm. And you yeah. know whether it's something like pure consciousness that we, uh, that we all sort of attain at some point or whether it's a forced alchemical yeah. transformation of the self or yeah. some other divine yeah. plan. I have no idea what she's really getting at, but I well, think it's all it's wrapped up in there. very interesting you mentioned the alchemical thing. Yeah. Because it is, it is a very alchemical discussion to discuss what happens when we get conceited mm. when practicing alchemy. Yeah. <laughs> it blows up in our faces. <laughs> you know? If you yeah. make the wrong move, it blows up in our faces. Her story of Jose is one of of someone suffering from hubris. You know that word? Yeah. Hubris is like puffing up oneself, Mm -hmm. like self-importance, like Trump, you know? (laughs) That's hubris, you know, but taken to extremes. And Jose's hubris is encouraged by this Vera, and he gets, he is seduced by Vera. He can't help it, you know? He makes all kinds of compromises just to just to go to bed with her or whatever, you know, that idea is. And Grace fixes him up and then he's just great and everything's beautiful and then and then he falls victim again. And Vera convinces him that he's great, he's famous. He shouldn't be just lying around talking to this poor woman, you know, who's in you know, runs a rehab place, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, it actually says that in those letters. In the later yeah, book, yeah, I know. You know? It, it's, you know, as a psychological profile of, of, of what I call a modern disease. Well, it's not modern and timeless disease and conceit. Yeah. You need to conquer, you know. Well, you know what it is? It's a human disease. It's kind of plagued us throughout yeah. our history, I would think. Yeah, well, I think you summed up that, that very, very beautifully, you know? You've got a very nice picture of what you've read. I really enjoyed it, and I've enjoyed our conversation here. We could probably talk for hours about this. In fact, I, I'd, I'd like to. But... Yeah. At any time, Brian, feel welcome to uh, to send me an email if you have any 
anything you want to know. I will absolutely do that, and good luck with your research, good okay. luck with your writing. Maybe we can talk again uh, down the line here when you get something out. Yeah, okay. Thank you again so much for your time. I appreciate the conversation, and um, I'll talk to you soon, all right? A pleasure, Ryan. Ooh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. My thanks again to Richard Arman. Cannot wait to see what he does with this material. You know, one of the themes I've come to know about the occult is there's a lot of window dressing, a lot of misdirection, a lot of complications and complexities, and the truth usually ends up being a lot simpler than it seems at first glance, and this story is no exception. It actually kind of pisses me off that Richard's account of Erlinger's life and death is nowhere to be found online, at least until now, but I just... I can't help but wonder why people keep writing about and perpetuating this story or this myth about her dying from poisoned oysters. I guess when that's all that's out there, the average person has no choice but to believe it, but where's our independent investigation? Thankfully, the most noble of truth seekers never stop seeking, and I have to commend Richard for his diligent pursuit of truth. I mean, you heard him. He makes a great case as to why the book was confiscated and dispels this rumor of Irene being murdered for what was in it. Although, we do have to ask, are his assertions and is his research correct? And I suppose time will tell. It usually does. Anyway, my thanks to all of you for being here. Hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or whatever network you're listening on. If you are an iTunes user and you like what you heard, give us a good rating. If not, email me, occulturepodcast at gmail.com. Tell me what's working. Tell me what's not working. Tell me to go fuck myself. I would appreciate any of those messages. Also, there's links to our social media profiles in the show notes as well. If you're the liking and following type, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, Snapchat, we're saturating the fuck out of that market, I'll tell you what. Either way, you've been listening to O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.